Hello, I'm Luxbosh. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on My Little Pony, French Biz Magic, Season 4, Episode 19, For Whom the Sweetie Bill Toils. A nice callback at the beginning episode to Sapphire Shores right off the bat. Now, it was definitely nice to see tiebacks to an earlier season. And it's nice to know that Rarity continues to have her as a client. Especially considering that always when we see Rarity, she's still operating out of Ponyville, even though she has all these further away clients, and she's done these fashion shows, and she's done stuff in Canterlot. I don't think most of her clients are in Ponyville. Don't think so. Though she must be raking in quite the bits by now. One would hope so, but imagine what the base cost of her gowns is, considering all the gems she uses. I mean, I know she's good at finding gems, but even so, I would imagine that occasionally she has to purchase them or pay someone to cut one down or have it faceted differently. Though, based on Dog and Pony Show, it looks like you get to take perfectly faceted gems straight out of the earth. Wow, I wish we could do that. And to mention the cost of fabrics and if she has to get any exotics. Which she probably has to do quite a lot of exotic things for Sapphire Shore because it was her most outrageous outfit that used every jewel she'd had that got Sapphire Shore's attention to begin with. Oh, I think I just remembered that that was also a Sweetie Belle Rarity episode. The last one that had Sapphire Shores in it? Or, no wait, that was Dog and Pony Show, wasn't it? Yeah, that was Dog and Pony Show. You're thinking of Sister Who's Social. The reason I was connecting the two is because there was a because Sweetie Belle overused Rarity's gym supply to make that art piece for her. So going back to this episode, I like the touch of when Rarity drops her magic. Stoing! The scissors stab into her table. <laughs> and the reaction on Rarity's face when Sweetie Belle shows her the dresses is just priceless. It's absolute horror. They reminded me a little bit of the ones that Applejack made in Magical Mystery Cure. And I'm glad they show that Sweetie Belle is still terrible at sewing. Though she apparently has gotten at least a little bit better. They look like they belong on ponies, somehow. <laughs> also, Sweetie Belle makes an odd squeak when she's hugging Rarity there. I actually had to rewind that particular part of the episode a couple of times going, Yeah, that's definitely coming from Sweetie Belle. Why? That's an odd squeak. <laughs> and moving on to the play. I know Cheerly was supposed to sound excited, but she just sounded anxious to me. I didn't really pick up on her being anxious so much as, come on, let's go, you know, time to start, we want to stay on schedule. So I guess Sweetie Belle was trying to do a Shakespearean-like play? That would be my guess, because why else use that much archaic language? And I think her beginning lines were quite a bit redundant. I think she basically used multiple phrases for I came here quickly all in the same sentence. Probably. I didn't really actually even tune in on the lines so much as, oh yeah, this is going to be bad. <laughs> At least Diamond Tiara and Silver Spoon aren't in the audience. It's actually kind of nice how Apple Boom's the one who gets to say classy when they're all pointing out how they should be when they go out to meet their audience. <laughs> and speaking of that, they automatically drop it when they go out. <laughs> yeah, they say all the right things behind closed doors, uh, but immediately lose it when walking into the reception. Which, after the events of Twilight Time, you'd think they'd know better. Also, nice job to Spike for doing the exposition of how the story is going out. Though he did do a nice pick-me-up with the Cumeric Crusaders to brighten their mood. I'd like to know how they got this whole play thing organized, even. I mean, the audience seemed to be mostly adults. I know Cheerilee was there, but it didn't really feel like a school event. More like they might have gotten to use, you know, the school stage or something. Because a school event would have had more than three actors. And it wouldn't have been written entirely by Sweetie Belle. Mm. Yeah, that brings up the point of Sweetie Belle must have done a lot to get this all together. A lot of work. And considering that the play didn't really go over well, 
and that her two best friends had to rehearse it with her in order to put on this performance. As good friends, shouldn't they have brought up, you know, some of these lines seem a little redundant, or don't you think this is a little archaic for a modern audience? I don't think, based on previous experience with the Cunard Crusaders, that any of them had any idea how bad or good they were. You know, considering what happened in the Kinemark Chronicles, I think it was? Looking at their performance in the school talent show, yes, but look at their performance for the flag-waving team. That was very well executed. I think they were also more in their elements, per se. Plays, not so much. They're doing a good job this season on showing family dynamics between sisters and family overall. Did you notice Sweetie Belle and Rarity's parents in the audience? Because I didn't. No, I didn't see them either, though I wasn't really looking for them. Because I could be mistaken, but I rather thought that Sweetie Belle, for the most part, still lived at home with their parents and only stayed with Rarity occasionally. That's a good point, but I think they may have glossed over in this episode because they were focusing so much on the sister and sister dynamic. No, it's just that if they were doing it as a visit, it would have been a very good timing for Rarity to actually cancel since she had the Silver Shores, Sapphire Shores order to work on, even though it sounds like Sweetie Belle did a lot of helping. And who knows, um, the parents could have actually gone somewhere else where Rarity wasn't expecting to get such a heavy order and they're not available to pick Sweetie Belle back up again. Entirely possible, because the order that Rarity got from Sapphire Shore and Dog and Pony Show was very last minute. That's why she had to go out and hunt so many gems. The venting scene was well done. It felt very realistic to me, because I've been known to vent that way by myself sometimes when I'm frustrated about something. Oh, the, the venting felt very realistic, but her revenge seemed rather extremely cruel. I mean, she knew how important that stitch was, and she knew how important that order was. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about Rarity's business, not something that you really want to mess with, because, you know, it's something your sister lives off of. Yeah, so I know that we needed her to do something that she needed to be able to turn around and fix, but it seemed extremely cruel even for the level of frustration that Sweetie Belle had. I think she was doing something she perceived as being equal to how she got, how she felt that she was being overshadowed by. I think it also makes it so... When Luna compares her and her sister's dynamics to Rarity and Sweetie Belle's dynamics, it makes it feel a little bit stronger because it's a really bad thing to do. And when Luna felt frustrated with her sister, she went, well, she, she became evil, but that's in a different extreme. So I, I think they felt they had to make it at least a little bit extreme for it to be comparable. And I thought it was nice to have the comparison. You know, it let Sweetie Belle know that she wasn't the only one to have this difficulty. And I think it made Luna more relatable. I mean, the Alicorn princesses are kind of um, on a different level. And it made Luna feel very relatable for her to go, you know, Sweetie Belle, I've had to deal with the same problem. I like that they used Luna in this episode. And I like your points about how they made her more relatable. I think this also shows, once again, that she's nothing like how most of the fans perceive her. She's very calm and focused on things, compared to the energetic, out there version that everyone seems to perceive her as. But at the same time, both could still be true, because dreamscape walking is technically part of her job, which would be something she would take seriously, as opposed to going and having fun, like on Nightmare Night. I think they wrote her a lot like her sister here because of the fact that she was performing her royal duties, because she felt a lot like Celestia to me here, but with, you know, that little bit of Luna tossed in. I like the nightmare imagery of the rarity cloud attacking. It was very fitting because Sweetie Belle always feels like rarity's raining on her parade. Yeah, I was going to bring up that metaphor as well. And the dream sequence overall reminded me a lot of A Christmas Carol, how it had the past, present, and future, and how she learned from it and woke up just in time to fix everything. Now, it, it did very strongly harken back to that, but to start with, 
I'm guessing Scootaloo told Sweetie Belle and Apple Bloom about her experience with Princess Luna in her dreams on her camping trip because Sweetie Belle was not really surprised. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, you just rescued me from that weird cloud thing. Yeah, I'm probably dreaming. Okay, roll with it. Uh, why wouldn't Scootaloo have told her friends? It's an awesome thing to happen to you, the princess of the night visiting you in your... You know, if I went any further than that, that would be a fan fiction. Moving on! But the stuff that Scootaloo went through was a bit embarrassing, and she had to admit that she was afraid. Yeah, I don't think she would have to admit that she was afraid. She would just say to them all, tomboy, like, Yeah, it was really cool. Princess Luna visited me in my dreams, and then kind of dropped it at that. <laughs> or fudged things a little bit about what she was dreaming about. And moving into the past, present, future dream sequence, how do we know that's how Sweetie Belle's fifth birthday party actually went? Sweetie Belle didn't see. Luna was imprisoned in the moon at the time. And unless Rarity has specifically dreamed about that fifth birthday party, and the dream was an accurate representation of what happened, how would Luna know in order to be able to show it? I'm thinking time spells and Luna has more powers than we have perceived. That or... Celestia has been taking her place in the dream walking since she's been gone, and Celestia informed her about that. Celestia would never have time to sleep if she was raising the sun, doing all her daily royal duties, and doing the dream walking. Well, she would have to do it all the time. And speaking of the dream walking, I don't think Luna did this that much when she was younger during the whole turmoil of when she became Nightmare Moon, you know, before that. Because there's a couple of things. One, I think Luna would have seen some other things and two Luna would have helped more ponies and ponies overall would have been like less fearful of the night and more likely to enjoy other things. The ponies did learn to enjoy the night. I think it just happened too late for Luna to be able to see it. Her heart had already started to turn to darkness and probably as she started to grow jealous she may have even shirked those duties as she looked for ways to make herself more special than Celestia. Though I think how frequently she's been doing it now is more of a recent thing. Probably. And Luna doesn't quite sound the same as in other episodes, even though Tabitha St. Germain is still voicing her. I think it's because she doesn't voice her as often as she does Rarity. And I'm talking more about the tone of the voice and not the way she speaks. Oh, and I forgot to mention, I like how they show Luna concentrating when she's manipulating things. Like, it's not just that easy for her to do stuff. She actually has to focus a little bit to be able to manipulate, show Sweetie Belle what's going on, and change the imagery around her. And speaking of that imagery, this is a kid's show, right? That was, like, kind of freaky to me. Yeah, it was definitely very dark, but it reminded me a bit of Fluttershy's panic sequence in the episode where they had to get the water, and where they had all the laughing and the staring eyes and though through this dream sequence we get some new philly designs as well the other thing i want to know is how do the girls manage to get on a train to go to canterlot with no one realizing they're obviously minors so wouldn't that bring up a question with the conductor that you have unchaperoned minors on a train who had enough bits to get them three seats on a train how quickly does the Ponyville train go that they could make it in time when Rarity had already left? And first, I'm going to guess it's a weekend because otherwise they would have missed school. Secondly, it hasn't been that long since we had an episode of Applejack being overprotective of Apple Bloom. So how does Apple Bloom get to go off by herself? Not just the overprotectiveness, but the you are in so much trouble that we addressed probably wouldn't carry over into future episodes. Wow, I only thought of one of those things, which is, wait a minute, don't they have rules in the question about minors riding on trains by themselves? That's the only thing that my brain popped up was like, wait a minute, how do they keep doing this? <laughs> and who knew Apple Boom liked pop music? I never really saw her as a person who would like pop music. Not even country music, really. I just, you know, kind of saw her liking music in general. I can understand Scootaloo being into pop music, though. I would have picked Scootaloo more as rock and roll, assuming Equestria has rock and roll. 
Though I do agree with the fact that Sweetie Belle likes show tunes. Makes sense for her. Yeah, I liked her friend's reaction when they're like, Actually, I prefer show tunes. It was just like, ugh. I guess the Apple family has really good opposable tails, or it's just an earth pony thing in general because they use those tails a lot to grab things. I'm like, wait a minute, tails are mostly hair, right? I guess in Equestria, there's maybe bone going all the way down it, and it has muscle? Because <laughs> dang, they use those tails for everything. Also, I like the swing through the window, splat, splat, spin. Uh, you like it with the cinnamon ribbon? Run. I guess Apple Bloom and Sweetie Belle landed safely on something below because ugh, they seem to come in through the door fine. Yeah, well, it's a comedic moment in a cartoon. You're not actually allowed to get hurt. I guess they're pretty lucky that the hairdress didn't get even more damage from all the tossing around it got. Well, I'm sure that Rarity would have packed it very carefully, even though we don't see any sign of packing material when she puts it into or takes it out of the box. And as they're tossing the box around, once again, why not just use unicorn magic? Rarity could have just taken the box. And how we spoke about Celestia needing sleep earlier if she was taking over Luna's things. Luna's up during the day. Doesn't she need rest as well? You would think so. So I'm guessing that high-level alicorn princesses don't need as much rest? I'm guessing, considering Celestia ruled by herself for over a thousand years and she had to take care of both the sun and moon. Yeah. But it was very nice of Luna to come back and help Sweetie Belle. Mm -hmm. Especially with that little tip about, she likes dolphins. Yeah, which brings me to the point of, mm, I don't know, insider information and uh, privacy? Of course you'd bring up the privacy card. None of which I thought about while I was thinking about that particular thing I just said. <laughs> but it was for a good cause. <laughs> It was for a good cause, but Luna is walking through people's dreams. There's a certain level of ethics that kind of needs to be expected there. I mean, this was a small thing and it was helpful, but this could just as easily go another way of, oh, hey, you know, so-and-so, they're terribly afraid of this. Oh, look, I have leverage in this next business meeting. <laughs> I can see that being good for insider trading. <laughs> mm hmm. As, you know, dreams are the subconscious, so fears and desires is probably a good portion of the reason that Luna went evil. Maybe. I don't know. We'll find out one day, I hope. Well, think about the different time. I mean, it was a thousand years ago, so tons less technology. Ponies struggling harder to survive, you know, and the dislike of the cold and the dark would be in those dreams, and fear of the dark would feature in the nightmares, which makes her a feared creature. And it might have been harder for her to visit their dreams in the night because they might see her less as the prince as more of a nightmare figure, even though she was trying to help them. Yeah, so it would be more of, fear not, citizen, I am here to help you. Ah, monster! <laughs> Especially if she used the royal voice. Quite. Feel not, citizen! My ears! I'm dreaming and that hurts. I like that Sweetie Belle was able to actually add something to the design for the headdress for all the trouble she caused. But I definitely preferred Rarity's design. The dolphin was completely out of place with the rest of the headdress. Yeah, I see that. It felt a little out of place to me as well. But it worked for the scene. No, oh, it worked for the scene, and what mattered is that the client liked it. You know, when you're designing something, you as the creator want to be happy with it, but you also need your client to be happy. And if something is what your client likes, even if it's not exactly what you would have chosen... Mm -hmm. You have to make it work. I thought it was nice at the end that Rarity asked if she could see an encore of the play. It... it seemed kind of, I uh, don't know, the word I want is a letdown, anticlimactic, a bit of, oh my god, now you get it? That Sweetie Belle turns around and goes, oh, no, it wasn't that good. I think it mainly shows how overly focused she was on the fact that she thought that it was the dresses overtaking her play, 
and less about her play actually being bad. And now she realizes that her play was bad and the dresses just made it good. More that the dresses gave people something to look at during the play. It was a nice episode overall to me. It was well paced from beginning to end. I like that we got to see Luna again. And the comparison between Luna and Celestia and Rarity and Sweetie Belle's relationships was a nice touch. And the fact that Teretha St. Germain actually voiced four different characters in the episode is pretty good too. I also liked how they're trying new imagery this season as well. Now, the pacing on the episode was very good. I think my biggest problems were all the things I nitpicked. But the main thing for me was Sweetie Belle's revenge seems so much stronger than what it needed to be. Also, another Cutie Mark Crusader episode with no singing. Those three do like to sing. They were talking about music. It would have been nice to actually hear them sing part of one of Sapphire Shore's songs instead of just naming song titles on the train. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this, please consider subscribing or leaving us a friendly, friendly not in quotation marks, comment below. If you'd like to see full resolution versions of Lux's drawings, check out his account over on DeviantArt. If you'd like to keep track of each episode's progress, you can check it out over on Tumblr. Lux has also agreed to answer questions that are posted there. Links can be found in the description. And this has been our thoughts on My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Season 4, Episode 19, For Whom the Sweetie Belle Toils.